Okay, so I assume that all of you who are on this uh, have at least seen HelpSpot to a certain degree, but I'm going to sort of go over what might be some basics just to make sure that everybody's on the same page. Um, I'm logged in here to our demo version of HelpSpot, and I'm just going to kind of go over at a, at, at a very high level the different sections of HelpSpot. Some of you who are on this call might be using uh, all of these sections. Some of you might be only using some. So I just want to make sure everybody has some availability. So this is what we call the workspace. This is where all of your requests are coming in. Uh, requests in HelpSpot, as you probably know, are created in a variety of ways. Some of them uh, might come in via email. In fact, I'm guessing for most of you, most of them come in via email. Uh, you can have HelpSpot connected to essentially as many email boxes as you'd like to bring those requests in. Every email that comes in creates a new request. But there are other ways to get requests in the HelpSpot too. Uh, we have a support portal, which I'll show you briefly in case you aren't using it, or maybe you know, you've thought about using it uh, before. And we also have all kinds of integrations and other ways to get uh, requests, to get information from other systems and to HelpSpot if that's something you'd like to do. We're not gonna cover all that because this is a HelpSpot uh, 101 call, but just to be aware of some of the possibilities uh, that are in HelpSpot. So at a high level, next to the workspace, we have a link to what we call knowledge for our knowledge books. So if you're not using this already uh, you know, in your current HelpSpot installation, Knowledge books uh, can be used to build documentation, both for your customers uh, and up on a public facing website and also private documentation for yourself and your team. We call them knowledge books because you can create as many books as you want. Those books are organized into chapters and those chapters have pages and we make it really easy to not only create that content, but then also to uh, be able to pull it up from right within when you're working on a request. So once we get a little deeper, you've probably seen this in HelpSpot already. There's actually, when you're working on a request, there's a, just a place where you can go and browse that documentation. So you might have documentation somewhere else and that's totally fine. Obviously you don't have to use HelpSpot. Uh, you don't have to use HelpSpot's knowledge books in order to do this, but it can be very handy. We think it's important. That's why it's there. Next to that is a link that depending on how your HelpSpot set up and what permissions you have, you might see or you might not see, and that's for reports. So um, we do, uh, you don't have to be an admin to view reports in HelpSpot, but some uh, installations have it set up that way or have sort of different levels of permissions. So if you're not familiar, reports might be kind of exactly what it sounds like, reports, metrics, analytics. Uh, this is a way to see how many, everything from how many requests you get over a certain period of time, but you can also measure things like how long is it taking us to reply to somebody? How long is it taking us to resolve questions? And a whole lot more. We're not really gonna to touch reports on this call, but if you're at all curious, we of course have documentation on our website. You can always contact us via email. We can you know, chat with you about how reports work. So if you're uh, sort of new to using HelpSpot and either you don't see that link or maybe you have seen it, but you haven't really uh, gone into it too deeply, just know that reports uh, exist. They can be really powerful. But as typical at HelpSpot, we try to give you power, but also make it pretty easy to use. So feel free to ask us if you like. Next to that, we have responses, which I assume all of you have at least seen that link. I'm not sure if all of you are using that, but responses are pre-written responses, those common answers to common questions. Uh, and a, a thing that happens for anybody who's doing support, almost anybody who's doing support, is you're going to have the same questions come up over and over and over again. And responses uh, are a way to pre-write those uh, to have it so that your team can always insert those no matter uh, you know no matter what they're doing so you know exactly how it's written but they can do a lot more than that they can add attachments um, they can change things about the request itself I will definitely show you responses in a little more detail later on we have a link up here to search so I'm actually going to open this up in another tab if you haven't really played around with search search and HelpSpot can be really straightforward right we just have a straight up full text search if you just want to type in a keyword and and start searching, but we also have the ability to build really detailed searches if you're really trying to narrow something down and find that super specific uh, request. Um, this sort of interface that you see here, you're gonna see this in a couple places in HelpSpot actually. We'll see that later with filters, which I'll talk about later. Um, but basically you're just sort of defining conditions. You, you know, what do I want to show up in this search? In this case, you know, we'd be saying, show me everything that's been opened in the past 30 days, but there's a very long list of things that you could search for, everything from category, status, uh, custom fields, if you have those, and I'll talk about custom fields later on, all kinds of date and time math that can be really interesting. So if you've never really uh, played around with search, I definitely would encourage you to do so. Go look, especially at the detailed search where you can really uh, craft interesting searches to try to get to that specific request that, you know, that you're looking for. 
the final thing that we have up here that I want to cover really quickly uh, is a link to the support portal. Now, some of you uh, might be using this at your current installation. Again, some of you aren't. Everybody uses HelpSpot a little differently. But if you aren't using it and you think it might be useful, this is a uh, it's a page that is included that is publicly accessible. This is included out of the box. There's no extra feature you have to turn on for HelpSpot or anything like that. And we give you a very clean uh, and simple but customizable page where your customers could submit requests. So if you have um, any sort of workflow or situation where you think it would be helpful to have folks be able to submit a request, not just via email, but via the support portal as well. And if you're not already using it, I would definitely encourage you to look at this because not only can you get all the same information that you can get out of email, name and email, and then of course the details of their request, you can also bring over HelpSpot's categories to then get even more information from them upfront. So in this example, we've got, uh, in this again, this is a demo with just some generic categories, but in this example, I'm saying, okay, this is the sales category. And then we brought along a custom field along with it. So I'm assuming many of you have seen custom fields in your own HubSpot uh, installation, but custom fields are additional ways to capture data. We'll talk more about them later, but in this case, it's okay, this is a sales request and I've got a location. So if you are getting emails, if you're in an environment where you could not only get emails, but maybe ask your customers to go to a website to submit a request, again, this can be a really great way to get more information about that request before it even gets to your inbox, before it even gets to your queue. So not everybody on this call is gonna maybe have the ability to, uh, to insist that their organization uses this, but if you're not aware, uh, the support portal exists and it can be really great. And so not only is it for submitting requests, one last thing I'll show you, again, that documentation that I was talking about. So I make it really easy. If you do decide to create documentation in HubSpot, you can then have those public documentation books show up here. We have just a generic one called documentation, very creative title, but uh, you can kind of see the idea here where you can just have these pages that could be really simple, but clean and accessible, right? Text, headings, um, not just, link, not just uh, text and links, but you can have tables, you can have images, you can add attachments. Um, and again, the overall look and feel of this is extremely customizable. Uh, your organization, if you decide to use this, can actually customize the HTML and the CSS, the code underneath. And we have some customers who all they do is they, you know, they might change out the logo, uh, maybe change a color or two, and that's totally fine. But then we have other organizations where they totally revamp this page and make it look just like one of your regular web pages that your customers are used to going to. So all kinds of options here. Uh, if this sounds like something that you think your organization uh, would, would like to do and you aren't already doing it, might be a good idea to raise that question. And again, if you have any uh, any questions about how this all works, we're always here to help. Our support team is always here and we can, you know, we can always help you out. All right, so let's go back to uh, this workspace page here. I am logged in. And actually, before we get into the request, there's a couple, th I'm gonna talk about the very last thing that is up here on uh, at the top of this page because uh, I just know from talking to customers all the time, a lot of people kind of miss out on this. And that's the user preferences. So the last thing that we have up here at the top is the ability to go into your user preferences. So if you've been using HelpSpot for a little while and you haven't really gone in here, I would definitely recommend doing so. Yes, you've got things like your first name and last name and your email, but then underneath at the bottom here, you've got some really interesting options that might be useful to you. And I want to call some of them out. So one of them is the ability to set an out of office status. So some organizations might uh, are obviously already using this, but if you're not using this and you think it might be helpful, this is the ability to go in and tell HubSpot, I'm not going to be here. And what do I want to happen when I'm not here? So in this case, I could say, you know what, just forward everything to the inbox and then just let people pick it up. That's fine. But maybe you have a backup. Uh, you know, maybe when I'm gone, I want everything to go to Ian, who's on this call. Sorry, Ian, you're going to get all my, my requests. Um, and then if I save that now for as long as I've got that set, anything that comes into me and would normally be routed to me will instead get routed to Ian. So that can be really handy if you're not already using that. The other thing that you can do here is you can set up your signature, uh, your email signature. Not everybody uh, knows about this, but if you're you know used to working in Outlook or Gmail or any other mail client, you know what probably what email signatures are. So you can come here and you can configure both a text version and an HTML version. You're almost certainly going to want to supply the HTML version, which lets you have different fonts and colors if you need to, but you can also just keep it uh, really simple and straightforward and just have the text. The last thing I wanna show you, there's, again, there's all kinds of notification options uh, that you can look at here. You can determine how you wanna uh, receive notifications. Do you wanna get email notifications? 
Um, believe it or not, you can put in your uh, cell phone number and your carrier, and you can get notifications via text message as well, if you'd like. The last one I'm going to show you down here, if you're not already using it, is uh, the ability to enable keyboard shortcuts. So this is not, this is almost a little bit more than a one-on-one function, but since I'm here, I wanted to show it. So if I click this and open this up, it's actually going to tell me what the different keyboard shortcuts are. So if you are somebody who likes to use keyboard shortcuts in other applications, this could be really great. So uh, the keyboard shortcuts, you can use the arrows or some of the keys to navigate up and down a list of requests when you're on a page. You can uh, create requests. You can use a one, two, or three to jump directly uh, between Inbox and MyQ, all kinds of niceties. So if you're somebody who is starting to get into HelpSpot and you've, uh, you're you used to using keyboard shortcuts and other apps, uh, well, we have good news. You can turn it on. And uh, if I do that and then hit save, it would, it would then turn that on. All right, I know I said that was the last thing. One last thing I wanted to note here. This is an option. Uh, default notes to public on the request page that a lot of people miss. So when we're inside of a request later, um, once you open it up, you have the ability to send public or private notes or external notes as well. And by default, um, it is set so that you def that your notes are set to public. Meaning if you open it up, you just type something in and hit update, it's going to send it as a public note. But if you are in an environment where maybe you don't want to accidentally send a public note, that would be terrible. Or you know, maybe uh, you've got, uh, you know, folks who, uh, well, for whatever reason, uh, I could name a whole bunch of them. Just to give you an example, I used to run an IT desk with, uh, at a university with a lot of students, and I always set it up so that my students defaulted their notes to private, meaning that if they went in and typed, they didn't actually accidentally send a private note to a customer that they had to specifically select out. And so that is an option in the preferences. This comes up all the time uh, when I'm on calls with people, so I wanted to tell you all about it. All right, now let's go back to the workspace and let's actually just walk you through all of this. Some of this is going to be, like I said at the beginning, very straightforward and this might not be new to you, um, but if it is, then, oh, let's see, we have a question. Oh, good, already have a question come in and hopefully you saw that, we'll tackle that later. So let's talk about just creating requests um, because you have work that comes into HelpSpot. For most of you, it's gonna be coming in via email. Uh, some of you are going to be having it come in via that support portal, or you might have it come in via any number of integrations and other things that you can that your company can configure to have requests come into HelpSpot. But sometimes you just need to track work manually. Maybe it's something that came out of a, a meeting that you were in. Maybe somebody sent you a Slack or a Teams message on the side. Maybe somebody stopped by your, your, your cubicle or your office. Either way, sometimes you just need to go in and create a request. So obviously you can create a request. Underneath that left-hand side, we've got... Uh, a number of links. For some of you, you don't see the trash, so it's only three, inbox, my queue, and spam. For those of you who uh, your user accounts are configured to allow you to see the trash, then you will see trash as well. I'm gonna start with spam and trash just because they're the least interesting. Um, you all probably already know this, but just so everybody's on the same page. Obviously, when you connect email uh, to HelpSpot, spam filters have gotten a lot better over the last 10, 15, 20 years, but stuff still slips through. You all know this, you see it in your own individual emails every day probably. And so sometimes when things come into HelpSpot and they are spam and you don't want them to count against your statistics, you don't want them to just muck up your queue, muck up your inbox, you can, of course, mark things as spam or trash and send them and send them there accordingly. Not super exciting, but anytime you're dealing with email, it is important. Let's talk about the inbox because this is something that is pretty important. And again, I'm saying this a lot, but I, you know, I feel like I need to because everybody's HelpSpot is set up a little differently, but I want to kind of explain to everybody how this works at a base level. And again, if you have specific requests, we're, we're happy to answer them. So by default, everything that comes into the inbox is, I should say all new requests, regardless of where they come from, end up in the inbox. And you can, and your organization might, you can set up different rules and different things. So that's not the case, right? Maybe if you're using the, that support portal form, if somebody selects a specific category, it goes to somebody else. There's all kinds of ways you can configure this. But by default, everything comes into the inbox. And there are typically two different ways that teams uh, like to work. Um, one way is everything comes in the inbox and it is kind of the team's collective responsibility to just check on that inbox throughout the day. And so in those situations, that's great. You just come in here and you've all seen this probably, I'm guessing. You click that take it button and you can start working on it and that's totally fine. 
The other major way that folks typically like to work with a shared inbox is it's maybe one or two people's, maybe not full-time job, but a, a just a smaller subset of people. It's their responsibility to distribute work out. So in that case, HelpSpot, and there's other reasons why this is good too, but HelpSpot has these really great uh, bulk controls, for lack of a better word, on the left-hand side, these checkboxes, which lets you do things like select a bunch of requests and assign them out to people. But it also lets you do some interesting things. And if you've never played around, if you've never really explored this, this just could be good to know in general, because these controls aren't just on the inbox. They're on all of those screens that list that request in HelpSpot. So you can also close uh, requests in bulk if you need to. Uh, but what's really interesting for folks, if you don't already know about this, is the ability to do a batch response. So this is for situations where you've got something that has gone wrong and lots of your customers, whether you support internal or external or both, lots of your customers are all of a sudden writing in with a very almost identical uh, question about the exact same thing because some service is down or you know, if you're an HR team, something happened with payroll or open enrollment season, or if you're an IT team, some, you know, some site is down somewhere or whatever the case might be. And in those cases, the ability to select all of those requests and then do a batch response is wonderful because it means that you don't have to go and write the same thing to, to you know, 50, 100, however many different people you, or you don't have to worry about copying and pasting or anything like that. You can just write that one response and then deal with all those requests right then and there. You also have the really great ability to merge requests in. So some of you probably are already familiar with this, but this is great for those times when somebody is doing, uh, I'm sorry, somebody, uh, not, not doing, somebody is having a problem and they are really eager to get it solved. And so maybe they write you at the end of the day and they write you again at the beginning of the day, the next day, and they just keep writing in because they're worried maybe, you know, their request has gotten lost in the ether or whatever the case might be. But you have two, three, four, multiple requests all from the same person about the same problem because they are very upset. Well, you can just select all of those requests, merge them into just one uh, main request. And that way you also get all of whatever they wrote for each of those requests all along the way. They all get merged in, which is great because and you all probably know this and see this in your own, um, uh, in your own time doing support. Oftentimes when people write in multiple times, they'll give you slightly different information each time, right? Maybe they give you a little bit more the first time or a little bit more on that very last one. And so it's nice to have all that context just in one request. <laughs> so you also have the ability to change uh, the status in bulk. I'm sure you all are familiar with the status. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about some things that you can do with the status that you might not have known later, but you have the ability to change the status in bulk. And then you can mark things as trash or spam if you need to. The last thing I want to cover here on this inbox is that uh, if you've never explored this up here in the options, and this is true not just of the inbox, but also of the MyQ page and all the filters that we'll talk about later, you have the ability to customize how this looks. So if I go up here to options and then click on customize columns, I have the ability to, I can, first of all, I can move these around at will and I can have uh, the columns appear in a different order. These numbers here indicate how wide that column is, so I can even customize how wide the column, uh, each of those columns are. But then under, you know, on this menu, I have a pretty long list of other pieces of information that I might want to put there. Um, so maybe you don't want to see the age of the, uh, of the request. Maybe you want to see uh, the date and time it was opened. Or, you know, maybe you don't just want to see that initial request column, which actually combines the subject and the body into one long thing. Maybe you want to specifically put um, that, uh, um, sorry, that email subject as its own column. Well, you could do that. Maybe you're, you're using that support portal and you're able to get category or custom field information uh, before somebody uh, on your team even looks at it because it's you know coming from the portal into that inbox. No problem. You can have a custom field show up uh, in that inbox or you can have a category show up. Basically, you have the ability to make this whatever it needs to be to make the most sense for you. So if you've never taken the opportunity to go up there and explore uh, what customized columns look like, I would uh, definitely recommend it. It can be really useful. So that's the inbox, which again is all requests. Um, this is where all requests by default come in. Now, uh, the last thing I'll say about this, uh, some of you undoubtedly work at organizations where you have all kinds of rules running or all kinds of things set up. So before it even gets to the inbox, it's automatically routed uh, maybe to you or to a subset of your team into a, you know, a, sort of a, a specific filter or something like that. So that might not apply to you, uh, some of what I've just talked about. All right. So the companion to inbox is MyQ. So MyQ is all of the 
uh, my cues, all the work in the help spot that is currently assigned to you, all the requests that are assigned to you. And you can see that this looks really similar to the inbox page, right? We still got all those bulk uh, controls on the side so I can reassign, I can batch respond, I can merge. I've still got the ability under options up here to customize those columns. So especially in the MyQ page, because by the time that it's ended up in the MyQ, now it's got things like a category, for example, right? So I'm going to add category, click customize MyQ, and now I can see what category uh, this request is uh, this request has associated with it right there immediately before I even click into it. So a lot of this is going to look familiar. There are a, a few new additions over here on the left-hand side I want to show you. So you've got one column here between this checkbox and ID, which on this page looks just like a green dot. So I'm actually going to click into this really quick, and then I'm going to click out so you can see a difference. Um, so um, that's interesting that it showed up that way. Why did it do that? Oh, because we had already replied to her. That makes sense. Okay. So this, uh, this column here shows you at a glance what is the red status, basically, of this request. So this green dot means that um, something has changed since the last time I looked at it. So if you've got a lot of things assigned to you in your queue, you know that you might reply to somebody but still leave it open. And so in that case, it's really helpful to know when is something, you know, if, especially if you missed the notification in your email or maybe you weren't looking, you can just look at this at a glance and go, oh, that's got a green dot. That's something new. I should click in it. Conversely, this left arrow means that the last thing we did is we replied to them. So I probably don't need to look at this because I'm waiting on a reply back from them. And then the third thing that you would see if I were to open one of these and there was no reply, nothing had ever happened with it, then uh, you would actually see a gray dot, which indicates... This has been opened. I looked at it, but I didn't do anything with it. So you have a really nice way to just at a glance look and understand what um, what you know what is the red status of these items in my queue. The other thing we have here compared to the inbox is we have an ID number. So as you all probably know, every request that comes into HelpSpot has a unique ID associated with it, and that's actually what this search box is over here on the left hand side. If you've never used it, this is a quick search. Uh, where if I type in any one of these ID numbers, so I will type in this one here, one here at the top, it's 12612. If I type that in and hit enter, it's going to just jump me right to that request. So in our experience, what we see when we talk to our customers, if you're in a place that's using HelpSpot, referring to these requests by their ticket number, by their uh, request number, I should say, sort of becomes second nature, whether you're talking to each other at a meeting or over email or in Teams chat or whatever the case might be, you might ask somebody, hey, can you look at ticket 12612 or something like that? And so that's what that quick search box is for right over there on the left-hand side. But again, aside from that, this page looks very similar to an inbox. You can customize, you can do all that multi-select options, um, et cetera. So we've talked about inbox, we've talked about MyQ, the last kind of screen that shows requests, and there, are, there can be many of these, but this is just a different type, are what we call filters. So I'm assuming all of you probably at least have some filters in your organization, but I kind of want to talk about them really quick just to give you an idea about what filters are, how they're used. Um, who knows? This might spark uh, some ideas for you to have new filters in your own uh, uh, in your own organization. So filters are a great way to basically create different views into the request in your system. And what do I mean by that? So let me give you an example. So if you're a manager, of maybe the whole operation or maybe just a small subset. Maybe you have a small sort of uh, portion of the requests that are yours, but you also share them with somebody else and you just wanna see everything. So in this case, we've created a filter. This is just showing me all requests that are open, right? Because the inbox is only gonna show you what's unassigned and the my queue is what's gonna show, it's gonna show you what's in your queue, but all open will show you everything that is across the entire system. But if you have a really big uh, help spot installation, that might be overwhelming, right? So. Let's show you some other examples. What if you've got a team or, you know, maybe you're just on a team and you just have, you just need to see what other people have in their setup. So we've created some, some demo ones here where I can see, oh, I can just have filters that show me, oh, this is what's in Chris's uh, queue to work on. These are all the requests assigned to Chris. I can see he has three. I can see Taryn has six. Poor Ian has 10. We're overworking Ian. Um, and this can be really great, not just if you're, um, you know, not just if you're a manager and you kind of need to stay on top of what everybody's doing, this can also be just useful as a member of the team. If you just, you know, maybe Daryl's out sick and you need to go and cover for Daryl, or maybe you just need to, you know, you, for whatever reason, you can help Chris with something and you can just go look and, and go into one of those requests and, and take a look at what's going on. But there are all kinds of other uh, things that you can do with filters. Another example we have here are filters by category. So maybe it's 
maybe it would be really useful for me to be able to say, okay, so in this demo, right, this is generic categories. You all obviously have different categories, but you can have things like, oh, here's a filter that shows me everything in this HR category or everything in the support category. And if you've never made a filter, they are pretty straightforward to make, actually. I'm going to go ahead up here to, um, actually, I'm going to go ahead and create this filter so you can see how this works. So filters at a high level, it can be really simple. Filters have a name. I'm going to call this Dave's test filter. Very creative, I know. You can even decide who can view this. So um, you know, if you have, in this example, uh, in this demo, I'm logged in. I uh, HelpSpot has this concept of permission groups. Yours almost certainly does as well. Um, and I'm in the help desk staff permission group. So I could say, you know what, share it with everybody who's on my same level, or maybe I want to share it with specific people. I'll keep this just for me, uh, just something I want to see for now. I can organize it. So uh, these, these uh, little drop downs here, these are actually folders. So I can group these into folders. Um, and then basically, this is very similar to what I showed with search earlier, but I'm basically defining um, what do I want to show in this filter? And so in this case, I could say, yeah, show me everything that's open, but I want to get a bit more specific than that. So I'm going to add something else. And there is a list, and I mean a very, very long list. Might look a little overwhelming, but there's all kinds of stuff you could do here. Maybe I wanted to see everything with a particular status. So we'll talk about status later on, but maybe I wanted to see everything that is marked as waiting for reply. Or maybe I want to see everything associated with a particular custom field if you're using custom fields. So uh, you could have, this is a custom field that has a dropdown. So I could say, show me everything that has that particular location. Or you can even do things, and this is one of my favorites. There's date and time options here with filters that can you, let you do really creative things. So one thing I always love is minutes since last public update. So let me explain what that means. So in HubSpot, you have this concept of public updates where a public update is either, it's basically something that it's uh, an interaction with HubSpot that the customer is aware of, right? Because you have public and private and external updates. So this is a way to create a filter that will show you, and we actually have a little handy dandy calculator in here, and I'm gonna put two days in here. So if I were to uh, create this filter, this would show me every request where it had been more than two days since there was a public update, but the request was still open. So for me, when I've run uh, support operations in the past, that was always a good indication that, you know, this has been open for two days, but nothing's happened. What's going on? Is this stuck? Did we forget about it? Did they forget about it? And maybe two days isn't the right number for you. Maybe it's one day or five days or whatever the case might be, but I can keep, I can stay on top of requests that are stale, for lack of a better term, with a filter. If you have an organization where you have, you know, set a goal where it's, you know, we're going to get back to everybody within an hour or one business day or uh, whatever the case might be, then you can create filters to do that. There are other uh, creative things you can do with filters that you can't do with regular, uh, that you can't do on the mic or the inbox page. One of them is you can group requests. So um, actually an example of this, I think if I go into Ian's filter, I saw this here. So you'll see we're grouping by this status here. So all these are the uh, requests that are active. These are the requests that are problem solved, but they're still open. Um, so let me go back here. Um, when I when I have these grouping options, yes, you could do it by status, but you could do it by category. So if you have to deal with requests in a, a large number of categories, but you want to kind of chunk them together so you can work with them all at one all at once, you can do it that way. Um, you could also group them together by time. This is also popular for folks. Sometimes they want to see requests grouped by the day that they come in. So if you've never explored making filters or the filter options, I would highly encourage it. Filters are one of the best ways that customers of HelpSpot tend to really customize uh, things so that they can get the views into their requests that make sense for them. Because inbox and MyQ, for a lot of folks, just aren't enough. And that's totally fine. That's why we have filters. All right. So we spent a lot of time talking about sort of the higher level of the workspace. We talked about inbox, MyQ, and filters. I'm going to go ahead into Daryl's requests. And you can see, actually, here's an example. Uh, Daryl's filter, we're grouping it by day, right? So I can see all the requests that came in on January 15th, the 16th, the 17th, and the 18th. So I'm going to just go in here, and I'm just going to click on one of these uh, requests. We're going to dive into this, and let's take a look. So again, I'm assuming almost all of you have seen uh, this screen, but I'm going to go over it in, in pretty good detail just to make sure everybody's on the same page. So up at the top here, we have information about the customer itself, right? First name, last name, email. This is all um, super easy to get either from the support portal or from email. Uh, no problem there. We have additional fields here. We have one for phone number and we have one for customer ID. 
And if you've never used those fields, you might be wondering how are we getting that information? Because, uh, you know, sure you could type it in manually, but that's prone to errors. And frankly, no, <laughs> you're not going to do it every single time, right? It's just not easy to do to, to, to keep, keep track of that. So HelpSpot has something called live lookup. So talking in too uh, uh, talking in too much depth about this is probably beyond the scope of this call. But if you don't know what it is, live lookup is a way for companies who use HelpSpot to connect HelpSpot to whatever their system of record is. So some of you on this call undoubtedly are uh, you are using live lookup maybe to connect to uh, what your IT department might call Active Directory, which has information about everybody inside your company. But you can connect uh, HelpSpot using live lookup to things like a CRM or a custom database you have. Um, if you are an HR team and you have an HRIS or an HCM system that has uh, you know, the ability to integrate with it, HelpSpot can probably, can probably talk to that in some way. And what is the point of this? The point of this is you probably, most likely, have information about the people you're supporting in some other system. Maybe you don't just have their name and their email, you might have their phone number, you might have what department they work for or their location, or you know all kinds of information that might be useful for you to see inside of HelpSpot. So this does require a bit of configuration. Uh, it's not something that you can just hit one single button to do. But I will say, for many, if not most of our most successful long-term customers, they almost certainly at some point end up looking at Live Lookup because it can be so powerful. Because you can do things like in this example, I'm not only seeing if I click on this Live Lookup tab, I can see more information about this person. But what you can also do with Live Lookup is you can set it up to automatically bring data from your other system into these custom fields over on the right-hand side. So again, talking in any more detail about this is probably beyond the scope of a one-on-one -on -one, one -on call, but just know if you think that this is something your organization might be able to take advantage of and you're not right now and you have questions about it, please don't hesitate, reach out to our support. We'd be happy to talk to you about how this works and how it might work for your setup. The last thing I'm gonna show you up here at the top, if you've never really explored it, is history search. So history search is great for those times when somebody writes in, uh, when they've, they've created a new request and they are vaguely sometimes referring to something that they wrote in about two weeks ago, two months ago, two years ago. And sure, you could open up that search, uh, you could you know, click, you know, go in that search and you could really start diving in and, and, and try to find the request they're, they're talking about. Maybe you might have to open another tab, but we wanna make it really easy for you to pull that information uh, right up from here in HelpSpot. So we've got a dropdown, right? Which actually gives you lots of controls, but most of the time you don't even need the dropdown. In this case, I'm in a demo and it's just showing you uh, because we only have one example, but if I had more, they would sort of be underneath this. And so this is the request that this person, uh, this is the only other thing this person has written in about. I can click on this, I can see the back and the forth, and I can see whatever we decided. But I, I mentioned this dropdown before, but what if something's changed? Maybe they are, maybe they accidentally wrote in from a different email this time. Well, I can match them by full name. Um, what if you are doing support for, you know, maybe you're in a, a business to business uh, sort of uh, company, you, you know, some sort of service, maybe and you support people who are all at uh, sort of different companies. If that's the case, maybe they're talking about something their coworker wrote in about, you can actually match by email domain as well and see everything that ever came in from that email domain. So lots of little tools here to try to make it as easy as possible for you to look up and find out what is this person talking about? That way you don't have to you know, hope that you can remember or go ask your coworker or whatever the case might be. All right, so let's move over here to the right-hand side. So this is where you have information about the request itself. And before we get to these fields, there's actually two things I wanna, I wanna quickly talk about because uh, a lot of folks uh, don't realize that these things are there actually. And um, so we have the ability, this little star here, this is the ability to subscribe to a request. So if you need to uh, assign this to somebody else, but you still wanna get updates on it, which is sometimes uh, common, maybe it's an important request, maybe you're their backup, who knows why? You can subscribe. Uh, if I click here, I will now subscribe to this, even though this is assigned to, to Daryl, which means I'm going to get notified anytime there's a change to this request. So this can, be, this can be a really great way to stay on top of things if you're a manager, or maybe it's just an important request that somebody in your team is working on and you want to stay in the loop. And rather than having to ask them or make them CC you on updates, you can just subscribe to it. So that can be a really nice feature that you might not know about. The other thing I want to show you up here is the ability to, to do a reminder. So if you have something that's come in and whether you want to send a reminder to yourself or to someone else on your team, in this case, I'm going to tell Ian, 
maybe because Ian's on vacation and I want, I want to remind him about this when he gets back. Uh, let's say he's going to be gone for the holiday season and he's back on, you know, we'll get him at 8 a.m. on the 27th. That's great. And so I'm going to put this reminder in here and I'm going to say, Ian, can you take a look at this when you get back? And then if I create this reminder, now it's created that reminder and Ian's going to get a note about it when he comes back. That's a really nice uh, feature that, again, if you've never explored this option up here, you might not know about. So underneath that, we've got information about the request itself. So statuses, uh, you all probably have different statuses than this because these are completely customizable. You all probably know that these are the way that you can just really quickly at a glance communicate uh, with the rest of the team. What is the status of this request? Typically, these kind of reflect the different steps in whatever your workflow is, right? So maybe problem solved or escalated isn't the right term. Maybe it's on hold or pending approval or you know, uh, waiting, you know, whatever, you know, whatever the terminology is, you can customize these. So if you are looking at your statuses that you have in HubSpot now and you kind of wish they were named something different, or maybe you wish you had a different one, you should, if you're not the HubSpot admin in your organization, you should ask that person or, you know, maybe ask the people on your team, is it worthwhile to add a different status or maybe remove a status, change a status? These are totally customizable. And then why would you want to set these again? So yes, you can uh, at a glance, sort of know what is the status of this request, but then you can do more with it, right? You can do things like create a filter. So um, if I set this to escalated and I had a filter that said, show me everything that's been escalated, I could I could easily see all requests that had that particular filter. You can run reports on it. You can do all kinds of nice things with statuses. Underneath that, we have categories, which are the different ways that you uh, break up requests. Uh, in this demo, it's things like sales and support and hardware. Your cate categories are going to be different. Um, every place organizes their help spot a little differently. And so I'm not going to pretend to know every single, how everybody's done it. But one thing I want to point out is a couple of things that categories can do. So if I click here into the server category, you'll see these reporting tags. So if you're not already taking advantage of this in your current help spot installation, tags are a way to basically allow you to have multiple, not quite subcategories, but something approximating it underneath a larger category. So this can be great. Maybe you have a lot of categories right now and some of them are kind of similar to one another or maybe they could be grouped. Well, you can sort of uh, you know, combine certain categories into one big category and then have use these reporting tags to get more information about it underneath. So if I go here to software, you know, if let's say I'm an IT shop, I could say, yep, this is a Mac problem, but it's maybe also an office problem at the same time, or maybe it's just a Mac problem. That way I don't have to have category software, Mac, software, Windows, software, Linux, right? It lets you um, have the simplicity of a fewer number of categories while also having the power of more detail for things like reporting. That's why they're called reporting tags, but also for filters. So, you know, if I was using this in an IT organization and I really wanted to know, I, I wanted a filter with just everything that had, you know, that was a software Mac problem, you could easily do that. Underneath that, we have custom fields. So you all might be using these. I'm guessing many of you actually are using these in your organization, but just to really quickly talk about them, they are uh, different basically different ways to capture information about the request that don't need to be in the body of the request necessarily, but they're important. So here are some examples, a due date. Maybe you have a category for project work that your team does, or maybe you just have a certain type of work where there really is a due date. Well, you can just have a due date field if that would be really helpful instead of trying to write that in the, the body of the request and keeping up with it. Maybe you support people in different locations. So here's an example of a location dropdown. Uh, that's a different, another type of custom field uh, that you can have. Uh, maybe you just need a, a text field for order number, um, but you can also have large text fields. You can have checkboxes, which allow you to do really interesting things uh, in combination with automation, which is a you know a bit outside the scope of the one-on-one -on -one call, but you can use these custom fields in all kinds of ways. And the last thing I'll say about custom fields, two things actually. Number one, they can be uh, across all of your categories, or they can be applied only to some. So if you have only some kinds of some types of work uh, that maybe would benefit from, say, a due date custom field or something like that, well, you can set that up uh, if you'd like, or you can have them apply to everything. Really, the choice is yours. The last thing I want to say about custom fields is just like categories and tags and statuses, they can be filtered. So uh, you could have this is an open by category, but we could also have uh, again with this location dropdown, I could have a filter that says "Show me everything in Building B." or maybe show me everything with a particular due date if you're using the due date field. Um, they can be reported on. So if you are using reports or interested in using reports, you can uh, really get really fantastic insights out of that, that data. So it's not just buried here in the request history. 
And you can even use it uh, in conjunction with automation. So lots of abilities there if you're not already using that or if you've ever wondered what they are and what possibilities you have. We, of course, also have the ability to mark a request as urgent, which does not a whole lot by default, actually. Um, it puts a red banner at the top. You see this button turn red. But that's because you can use HubSpot's automation to make it do different things. It's probably a bit outside the scope of this call. But um, you know, if you have questions about automation at all, please uh, don't hesitate to, to write in and let us know. Uh, we'd be happy to, to walk you through some of the possibilities. So down here at the bottom of, the, of a request, you've got everything that has happened with this request in reverse chronological order. So the initial note from uh, whoever has written in is at the bottom. In this uh, demo example, we're using sample text from Alice in Wonderland, which is why this might look a little funky. Um, but you can see this note from Gabriel. Um, and then this is marked as a public note. And that means public to Gabriel, public to the customer, right? He is aware of it. And that's contrasted by the private note, which is above here. So you all probably know this, right? We've got these three buttons, public, private, and external. Uh, these are different kinds of updates that you can do here uh, in HubSpot. And so this shows you Barry's private update. And then this public uh, note here, this is Barry's public update back to Gabriel, back to the customer. So Gabriel only knows about everything that's here in green, but those private notes are of course really useful. You all have probably used them before. Maybe you're reassigning it to somebody. Maybe you're just leaving a note for, uh, for somebody, uh, for yourself at the end of a long day and you wanna pick this up in the morning. Who knows what, maybe you just need to document something, but obviously private notes can be really, really useful um, in those situations. If you aren't super familiar with it, external notes are also really helpful. These are for situations where you need to talk to somebody um, about this request who isn't the customer, but also isn't on your team. Maybe it's somebody else uh, in your organization who doesn't use HubSpot. Maybe it's somebody who works at a, at a vendor that you contract with. Who knows what it is? Well, if you need to talk to them about this problem, you can click external note, and then you can modify this. Uh, the email subject here, uh, this, you have all the controls that you would get in your email uh, uh, client, basically. You can add people to the two line, the CC line, the BCC line. You can just write this person an email. And then when they reply back, it's going to show up here in this request history. So, you know, if you have those situations where you need to talk to somebody outside of HubSpot about a HubSpot problem, you don't need to go to your own email. You can do it right here from within HubSpot. That way, everything is in this request history. The request history, the goal is it's supposed to capture basically everything about this problem. It is the canonical source of truth, uh, for lack of a better word here. All right, a couple more things, and then we are going to uh, hopefully get to as many questions as possible. So we talked about public, private, and external really briefly. Um, in terms of updating requests, I'm assuming uh, most people on this call are familiar with this, but in terms of actually sort of typing in here, you of course can add attachments. You have uh, options for formatting like bold, italic, underline, links, bullets, et cetera. You've got even more hidden behind this icon if, you, if you've never really explored it. Things like uh, a block quote or indenting, you can highlight, you can change the text color, font size, all kinds of options to format things uh, you know, as, you, as you would expect. So I wanna talk about responses because responses are, again, we think really useful and I'm assuming most of you are using them, but if you're not super familiar, let me just sort of give you the uh, really quick uh, overview of how to use them. So responses, again, are those pre-written responses to common uh, questions. And we think they're so important there are three ways to access them from within a request. So I could come up here to the search box, excuse me. And I could just start typing in this demo. I've got a password reset. Oh, I don't have access to that. That's funny. I'm sorry about that. I have a test response and you'll see when I search test, I actually get two different options because that's what matches that. And if I were to insert one of those, click on one of those, it would insert whatever that response is right here into the body of the request. Um, but some folks don't like to search and I totally understand that. And that's why we have a menu. So you can, right now I just have a my responses folder with these two um, uh, test responses in it, but you could actually make as many folders as you'd like. So if you need to have some responses for some types of questions and some uh, responses for other ones, and you're more of a visual uh, sort of, you know, navigate by a menu person, you can go ahead and do that. That's no problem. And again, if I were to click on any one of those, it would automatically insert it. But if you're somebody who works with requests, I'm sorry, with responses frequently, you might not want to go up here and have to click, you know, move your mouse cursor, your trackpad up here and search or up here and browse. We actually have a shortcut right here when you're working on a request. If you type in the pound or the hashtag sign and then start typing, it actually does an autocomplete. 
And so when I click this, it's going to insert something. In this case, it just inserts the word test, which isn't super useful, right? Um, but it can insert, when you insert a, a response, it's, let me actually insert the other one here. Let me see what that one gives me. Also says test, that's funny. So responses can contain all kinds of stuff. They could be a sentence, it could be a link, it could be a multiple paragraphs uh, worth of information, but you could also have responses um, at attachments. It can control these email options down here. So maybe you've got a particular response when you write it, you want to also CC or BC somebody on it. Um, you can also change things about the request itself over on the right hand, over, over here on the right hand side. So you could insert a response and then have it change the category or the status or a tag or whatever you'd like. And what we always tell people when they start using HelpSpot is to sort of start small and just bring over whatever you currently have in your email client as templates, bring them over to responses, but then you all are now at the point where you've been using HelpSpot. And so you all probably know if you're using responses, there are probably common things that you do every time you insert a particular response. Maybe you change the status, maybe you change the category, maybe you change uh, one of these custom fields. And if that's the case, rather than having to do that every single time, you can customize that response to do that for you. So that can be a really great way, not only just to make the data entry better, to make your live a little easier when your lives a little easier when you're when you're editing a request, but it also means that if you're going to use filters and you're going to use reports, that data is more accurate. So that's responses in a nutshell. Um, I also really quickly because I want to leave some time for questions. The last uh, couple of things I want to show you here. So um, if you do decide to take advantage of the documentation functionality in HelpSpot, those links are right here, and so uh, you can see we have. Two books. One is called Documentation, and one is called Test Book. Very creative, I know. Uh, you'll see this as private because, again, you can have uh, documentation that is private that is just for your team. So, if I have this public documentation right here, I can click on this, and rather than having to go to some other site, it just opens right up here, and I can immediately read this. And not only can I reference this myself, but I could also, especially if I'm using that support portal and I've got this documentation for my customers, I could just link directly to that page right here. So, we try to make it really easy. Uh, for you all to uh, to work with. So the last thing I want to talk about really quickly, I forgot to do this before, before we get to questions, is the ability to notify people. So we talked about the ability to remind, we talked about the ability to subscribe to a request, but you can also notify people inside of HelpSpot if you need to. So if you've never taken advantage of this, it's down here in these email options, uh, which is uh, this little button with the paper airplane. You can uh, open or close it there. And you can notify one of your coworkers, I'll pick on Ian in this case here. So if I were to write a public update to the customer or a private note to, you know, just for ourselves in the system or whatever, if I notify someone here, um, uh, whether it's Ian or anybody else on my team, they will get a notification saying, hey, Dave has notified you about this request. Two things I can also do here. Maybe I need to subscribe Ian to all future requests. We make it really easy to do that. And then... The other thing I want to show you is just like with responses, we've actually built a shortcut right in here. So if you need to, uh, if you want to make sure you notify somebody, I can actually use the at symbol and start typing. And then I can say, I just need to notify Ian. And it just goes ahead. And I don't know what I didn't select. That's funny. This is why you don't do, don't do live demos, everybody. Let's try this again. There we go. So you can see when I, when I, when I uh, did the at thing for uh, the little at symbol for, for Guy, it automatically added him as somebody who's who's been notified as well. So this can make it really easy. If I'm asking Guy a question, I could say, Guy, can you take a look at this? That way it's sending him a notification, but it's still assigned to me. So we try to give you lots of tools to uh, talk to your coworkers inside of HelpSpot while still letting you basically keep stuff assigned to whoever it needs to be assigned to. Okay, that's hopefully a lot of the basics. Um, there's still uh, obviously quite a few things in HelpSpot. We didn't really talk about re reports. Uh, we didn't talk about anything in the admin section. We're actually thinking about doing a, a future uh, HelpSpot, HelpSpot webinar, webinar to go into more detail about stuff like that. But with the time we have remaining, I do wanna try to get to some questions here. So uh, thank you, Ian, for collecting these um, while, uh, while I've been talking. So uh, Tom had a question, uh, when out of office, what will happen for updates to tickets that are already assigned to you. And what happens is they are reassigned to whoever um, whoever you have selected as your person. So you don't have to go through and manually do that, which is great. Uh, question from Benjamin, when you batch respond, do you stay assigned? So from, uh, let's say from this my queue here, uh, if I were to select all of these and do a batch response, 
the answer is yes, if I already am, uh, if I already am assigned. But the thing that you can do is you could theoretically do that from anybody. I could come, I could come up here to uh, to Daryl's queue and I could just do a batch response myself. And you'll notice that when I, you know, when I do a batch response, it actually comes into this little, uh, you know, sort of modified view of the regular request window. And uh, I could change the category, but I could also reassign it to whoever I needed to at that point uh, if I wanted to do it that way. So batch response doesn't really affect who it's, uh, who it's assigned to unless you decide that you want to do it that way. Tom also asks, is there a way to unmerge if you merge by accident? Uh, the answer is no, you cannot. Uh, it's unfortunate, I know. But there is one thing that you can do sort of if you maybe have a, a couple simple requests that you, uh, that you merge together. So I didn't cover this, but if I look down here in the request history of an individual request, you've got next to the date and the time and the ability to pin. Actually, I should show you all this really quick if you've never used this. If you have a request where there's lots of back and forth, but there's one of these updates here that is sort of the canonical important update. You can actually click this pin uh, uh, button and it'll pin it right to the top here. So that way, no matter how many requests come in over time, maybe this has the really important information and you wanna pin that. But right next to that pin icon is the ability to, you've got a couple things here. You could quote this individual one, you could forward it, but you could convert this to a request. So that means any public or private update that is, uh, that is listed here, if you needed to, uh, you could convert that to an individual request. So you can't unmerge, but if there's only uh, you know one thing that has come in for the request that you merged and you just want to unmerge it, you could always come back here and then basically take that merged in request and uh, convert it back to a separate request. So not quite the same thing, but it does give you uh, some capabilities that you might not have known about. Okay, Ronald had a couple more questions here. Uh, so uh, Ronald wants to know, does the spam system learn? The answer is yes. Um, and then Ronald also wants to know, can you auto send surveys to the spam or trash? So HelpSpot has the ability and you're not seeing it in what I'm logged in as now because I'm logged in not as an admin, but in the admin section of HelpSpot, you have the ability to configure mail rules. So mail rules can look at uh, things like who it's from or the subject uh, line of an email or the body of an email, and you can have it match for words or phrases and then do things automatically with it. So I suspect you 100% could, actually I know you could set up a mail rule that would look for whatever the common uh, words or phrases are in these surveys that you're getting and uh, and send them automatically to wherever you need to send them, whether it's a spam or trash or just reassign them to somebody or whatever the case might be. Uh, let's see, Ronald also, also asked, can IP addresses be captured for incoming requests? So IP addresses are definitely used uh, in, uh, in some way with spam protection, but not generally collected. I think, and I think Ian uh, wrote this one as well. Yes, he did. Uh, you could probably do a custom field um, for IP address. And then on that support portal I talked about before, not only do you have uh, full control over design, HTML and CSS, uh, I believe you could also probably add maybe some custom JavaScript or something to actually capture that. Uh, while they're submitting it and have it automatically included as a custom field. So definitely a bit more advanced, but I think, and, and you can keep me honest here, I think that that's probably something you could do if you wanted. Okay, another question from Ronald. Uh, Ronald says, let's see, uh, numbering in bullets seems to apply to full message rather than just a selection. So let's play around with that a little bit. So let's go here, let's add some lines. So we'll do line one. Line two, line three, line four. So if I come up here and I just click, it's gonna sort of default to wherever you go here, whether it's numbers or bullets. If I do this whole thing, now I've got it right here. And then obviously if I hit enter, it's gonna do another one. But if I hit enter again, now I'm escaped out of it. So um, Ronald, not sure if you have a specific follow-up on that. If you, if you do, please put that in the chat, but yeah, sometimes that can be a, a little tricky um, for sure, since, especially since we're not showing you, you know, we don't have like the kind of view and uh, say Microsoft Word where it shows you every single bit of formatting that that's being applied. Um, but generally, hopefully that's uh, somewhat easy uh, to see. And the nice thing in here is you can always see when it's applied because it'll be sort of highlighted here, right? So you can see when I escape out of this, or I should say a backspace out of it, that it's, uh, it's no longer highlighted. Okay, um, so... 
Another question from Tom. Uh, let's see, how do notifications to subscribe tickets get to you? Oh, yep. So I think I covered that really briefly, but just to say it again, um, they are, uh, if I go up here into, actually, let me go up here to preferences for myself, and then down here, you have notifications. So how do I want to get notifications? So there's notifications via email. There's notifications via an alternate email. So maybe you have, what's one of these options here? Maybe you have a separate uh, email that you want to get things to for whatever reason. You can do that. Um, you can have all of your notifications sent as text messages. If you put the put your mobile phone number up here, um, you could say, well, actually, I only want urgent notifications uh, to, to get sent via text message. You can do that. And you could also have a separate option here, which kind of applies to all of these uh, selections above, but you can notify on unassigned new requests. So um, maybe you want to, uh, for whatever reason, maybe you just want to get notified every time there's something new in the uh, overall inbox. Well, you can select that and you can make that happen. Um, let's see, a couple other questions here. I know we're sort of getting, getting to the end here. So if you have to leave, uh, thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate it. We're going to send out a copy of this video to everybody. I'm going to sort of keep answering questions here as we go. So please feel free to hang around. Um, Ronald also has the question, do external notes include any of the ticket info or does it just send what you write? Um, so by default, it just sends what you write. But one of the things you can do in HubSpot, and I'm not logged into uh, a user that can get to that. And this is what admins can do, but you can customize we have email templates, basically. You can customize what gets sent to people. And in those email templates, there are all kinds of placeholders for things like custom fields, um, the person's name, the ticket, you know, the request number, all kinds of things uh, that you can do when you customize those email templates. Uh, that's something that, again, that only admins in HubSpot can do. But yes, you could absolutely have an external note that includes more than just what you wrote there. But by default, that's what it's going to include. Okay. so. We've got some quick follow-up on the bullets. So let me go dive in here and let's go work on one of these really quick. So Ronald says, add a paragraph at the top uh, first and then do the bullet. So let's do that. So let's say this is a test paragraph and then let's write a bullet. So let's say uh, item one and let's get that over. So I highlighted and that works, but let's just put it right here and do the bullet. Right, right here into the bullet. Yeah, uh, you know, Ronald, not sure what you're seeing uh, on your end, but um, but yeah, you know, if that's not working for you, if it's working inconsistently, honestly, it might be worthwhile um, submitting a, a support request and, you know, maybe we can dive in to see if something is just not configured right or, or who knows, but, uh, the, you know, the formatting for bullets and, and everything else should be hopefully uh, pretty straightforward. Um, the last question we have so far, and I'm not looking at the chat, but this is uh, what Yuna shared with me. So Chris asked, can uh, SMS be set to be only after hours? So not directly, but it is possible that we could do that maybe via a trigger or a rule. And again, I'm not logged in um, as, a, as, an, as an admin right now to be able to see, but I'm actually going to take a note and see if I can get back to you and... Uh, Chris, if you haven't already done so, can you put your, uh, just put, because uh, we have, I think, multiple people named Chris who who uh, signed up for this. Uh, if you can, Chris McCabe, thank you. All right, uh, Chris, I will get back to you about that and I'll let you know. All right. Well, everybody, we are at time. Um, I think that is it. So um, thank you all so much. Um, really appreciate uh, the, you know, taking the time to uh, hang out with us today. Uh, we're going to send this recording around. And if you have any questions about anything we talked about here or anything else associated with HubSpot, please don't hesitate to reach out. We're happy to answer your questions. And uh, thank you. Appreciate it.